And perhaps you are here tonight and you feel a bewildering sense of lostness in your life and in your family. There's something missing. You're not quite sure what it is. You may be a member of the church. Well, tonight you can find that something because that something is the Lord Jesus Christ. I haven't seen the movie Simon Birch, but I know that there's one line in it where the main character, a tiny 12-year-old boy, looks up and says, I want to know there's a reason for things. I used to be certain, but I'm not so sure. I want you to tell me that God has a plan for me. Tonight, I want to tell you that God has a plan for you and your life if you put your trust and your faith in Him. There's a verse of Scripture that is known by all of you if you go to church. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's John 3:16. And we look at our world today, and we see so much confusion and suffering, poverty, war, hate, racism, loneliness, boredom, unemployment, psychological problems, AIDS, murder statistics that are terrifying, divorce, moral problems, and suicide is on the increase, but suicide is no solution because your soul, the real you, lives on. You can put a bullet in your brain and kill your body, but you can't kill the real you because you were born to live forever. You're going to live either in heaven or hell forever. And a thousand years from tonight, you'll be alive. Now this scripture says, for God. I can't prove the existence of God. Nobody can prove the existence of God. You can't put God in a test tube or on a computer screen, but that doesn't mean that he's not real. He is the creator, and we've been reading a great deal about what they're finding out in space, especially through the Hubble telescope, and it's unbelievable. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Nowhere does it say, does the Bible try to prove the existence of God. He just makes that statement. God created it. The Bible tells us something about God. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, the Bible says. God is not confined to a body like you or me. God can be everywhere at the same time. God is also unchanging. I am the Lord, I change not, says Malachi 3.6. God never changes. In him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, the scripture says. God not only is unchanging, but God is also holy absolute holiness. He's never committed a sin. He's never thought of an evil thought. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Thou art of pure eyes and to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity. But God is also a God of judgment. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment. How many of us are prepared for the judgment? But the Bible also says that God is love. The Bible says God is love in 1 John 4, 8. Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31 says. A popular song a few years ago was, I can't live in a world without love. You don't have to live in a world without love. God loves you. No matter who you are or what your ethnic background or what your bank account, 
or how poor or how rich you are, God loves you. Have you ever thought about why God created us and put us on this little planet? God created man and woman and put them in a place called the Garden of Eden and God gave them a choice. It says that a, he put trees in that garden and he said of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil which is conscience he said thou shalt not eat of it for in that day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God said you will suffer and die if you eat of that tree but man ate of that tree. The Garden of Eden was probably somewhere in Iraq and that part of the Middle East now is being discussed in Maryland by the leaders of several nations. Man rebelled against God. We know that something's wrong with human nature. Where does all this racial tension come from? Where does all the poverty come from? Where do all the wars come from? And there are many wars being fought right now. Where does immorality and greed come from? Man has a terminal disease. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, the scripture says in 2 Thessalonians. Sin is a transgression of the law. And we're all sinners. Every person in this room, is a, in this stadium, is a sinner. It's a disease, a spiritual, moral disease that all of us have. And the Bible says we were born in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me, the scripture says. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're alienated from God. That sin came between us and God. And that's when we began to die. We have natural death, spiritual death, but there's also eternal death. Some of the words of the New Testament used by Christ to describe the penalty of sins are terrible. It causes us to shrink. He used the word lost. He used the word perish. He used the word condemned. He used the word punishment. He used the word torment. He used the word hell. He used the word everlasting fire. What does it all mean? It means that you will be forever separated from God and everything that's right and good and things that you enjoy here will be forever lost to you. But God decided to do something about it. God loves the world. My son, one of my sons and I were walking along the road close to where we live one day and we stepped on an anthill. And we looked down and several of the ants were wounded and Others were dying. Their house was destroyed. And I thought to myself, and I said to my son, I wish we could go down there and help them and tell them that we didn't mean to do it. But we couldn't do it. We were too big and they were too little. How in the world could we communicate? There was no way. And God looked down from heaven and saw this planet and saw all these people like little ants, crushed, hurting, dying because of sin. He said, I love them. I want to do something about it. Do you know what God did? God became a man and that's who Jesus Christ was and God decided to come down and live like a man but more than that 
He took our sins on that cross. Every sin I've ever committed, every evil thought I've ever had is on that cross. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Think of it. He was made to be sin. He bowed his head and said, it's finished. The crowd that had been laughing and sneering began to tremble as the earth turned dark and an earthquake came. But Jesus said something else. He said, I'm going to rise from the dead. And he said later, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. The Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Because of what Christ did on the cross and what he did by being raised from the dead. But more than that, the Bible says he's coming back again. Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Yes, he's coming back with all the great powerful angels of heaven. And he will destroy everything that's evil in this planet. And he's going to build a world beyond anything we could ever dream of. And if you know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, and you have him in your heart, you'll be there in that world to come. What a promise that is. But you have to do something. You have to respond to God's offer of love and mercy and forgiveness. God said, I'll forgive you of everything you've ever committed. But you have to repent. The first sermon Jesus ever preached on was repentance in Matthew 4. Somebody said repentance means that you're sorry enough to quit. It's more than that. You confess to God and say, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of life. I'm willing to turn around and start in a whole new direction in my life and mean it. And the second thing, you must come by faith. You can't prove it. The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And in this computer age in which we live, I thought a cartoon in the paper a few weeks ago put it very well. Someone wrote to the pastor and said, Dear preacher, what does God forgive you mean? Signed, confused. The preacher wrote back and said, All your files are deleted. <laughs> That's what it means. All your files are deleted. All your sins are forgiven. God not only forgives you, but he adopts you into his family and you become a child of God. And a thousand years from now, you're going to be with him. We're going to be in a place called heaven. What a wonderful hope we have. But you see, there are so many people that are in the church today. Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox. We believe with our minds and we try to live it and we go to church when we feel like it. 
but deep in our hearts we are not sure that we really know Christ. And he has said to repent and commit and live it. And you haven't done that. Or you're not certain of it. You have doubts about it. You'd like to be sure. This is one of the shortest crusades we've ever held anywhere. We used to would never go anywhere unless we could stay a six weeks. But to come for three nights, it means that you have such a short time to make that commitment. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment right now. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front here and we're going to have a prayer. I'm going to say a word to you and give you a little book that we've prepared for you called Living in Christ. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. And if you come from the top gallery up there, it'll take an extra three or four minutes, so start now. Don't leave here tonight. Don't take the chance. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. We never know. You need Christ. You've come here tonight not sure. You've come here tonight with a longing for something you're not sure what it is. But it's Christ. You come, young, old, whoever you are. 